Tonight I want to talk to you about sickness and sin. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 5, and we're going to be looking at verse 19. But before we read this verse, let me make a statement. And that statement is simply this. And I know this might be a little far out for some of you, but just hang on. It'll all come into focus as you continue to attend these Bible studies. Amen? You know, we don't always get a revelation the first time we come to church. We don't always get a revelation the second time we come to church. Sometimes we've got to be coming to church faithfully for many years before we get a true revelation. You just never know when revelation is going to hit you right between the eyes. But if you keep your ears open and your heart open, then you become a receptacle of revelation. And so the statement I want to share with you is simply this. It's always, it's always, it's always, it's always God's will to heal us. Oh, but pastor, I know somebody who didn't get healed. I don't care what you saw. I've been saying this for years. I'm not moved by what I see. I'm moved by what the word of God says. And God's word teaches it's always God's will to heal. And I know this because Jesus only did what he saw his father do. And here in John chapter 5 verse 19, it says, Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Now listen, the son, that's Jesus, can do nothing of himself but what he sees his father do. For whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. I think I need to read that whole verse again. Listen up. Most assuredly I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the father do. For whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. Now turn with me to Hebrews chapter 1. I'm trying to build a little platform here to build on this evening. And here in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, Hebrews 1 and verse 3, it says, Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. This verse is saying that Jesus is the express image of God the Father. The Greek word translated expressed image speaks of of an identical copy, identical copy, or a perfect representation. So according to this verse, God's word reveals that Jesus Christ is the identical copy and perfect representation of his father. In fact, he only spoke what he heard his father say. He could only do what he saw his father do. Now, why is that important? Because we can be confident in determining the will of God concerning healing by looking at the life of Jesus. In the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, There is not one example of Jesus ever putting sickness on anyone. Now the modern church today preaches that God makes people sick. And the modern church is misrepresenting Jesus completely. Because it is contrary to the perfect representation of Of Christ. It's totally opposite the exact image Jesus gave 
you and I, of his father. Again, not one single time did Jesus ever make anyone sick. Let me take that a step farther. Not once did he ever refuse to heal someone. Now, there were a couple of times when someone refused to receive healing, but it wasn't because Jesus didn't want to minister to them. They wouldn't receive it. We're going to cover this material as we go through this series. And again, there isn't one single time that Jesus said to a sick person, no, I can't heal you. God wants you sick. Not once. He never laid hands on a person and gave them an infirmity or a disease. That's not the way Jesus represented the Father. Now understand that there are 17 times in the gospel where Jesus healed all that were sick in his presence. There are 47 other instances where Christ healed at least one or two people at a time. And yet, you cannot even find one instance where Jesus refused to heal a person or put sickness on someone. Now I'm going to show you why that never happened. Because in Acts chapter 10, turn there with me. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. It reads, how God, who? God the Father. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Ooh, now you can reach back to Sunday and take hold of Pastor Mike's message. The Holy Spirit brings with him power. Deutimus. Somebody ought to shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. So God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Now watch this. Who went about doing good and healing a few sick folk. What's it say there? Healing who? All. All. Now watch this. All who were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. My Lord. Let me say another important statement. God is not the author of sickness. He is the author of healing. He is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that healeth thee. Now, I understand that there may be some of you saying, Pastor, I'm going to disagree with you. I, I know that. But just stay with the word. Because if you ever deviate from the word, you're on your own. Did you hear what I just said? Listen to me. Under the Old Testament law, sickness, infirmity, and disease were never considered blessings. Let me say that again. Even under the Old Testament law, sickness, infirmity, and disease were never considered blessings. In fact, we don't have time tonight to to, to really examine this particular passage. But if you get the opportunity, sit down with the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 through 14, list the blessings promised to those who would keep God's commandments. 14 verses of blessings that God said are yours if you keep his commandments. Then verses 15 through 68 describes the curses that would come upon those who didn't obey God's commandments. Are you with me? Now you need to understand that you and I today are no longer under the old covenant law. 
We are in the new covenant today. We don't have to keep all of the Old Testament law in order to receive the blessings of God. Why? Because Jesus redeemed us from the curse of the law so that the blessings could come upon us by faith in him. Are you hearing me? Now, I want to prove that to you, so go to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. You know, if I just shut up and sat down, you'd already heard enough tonight. And I got to tell you, I'm doing better preaching and teaching than you're doing amen in right about now. Y'all ought to be the happiest people in the world just, just because of what I'm teaching. You, you, you almost should become unglued, so to speak. Look here in verse 13. It says Christ. Who? That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Watch this. Christ has redeemed us or bought us back from the curse of the law. Having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus. That we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ is not cursed. It's blessed. Why? Because Jesus took the curse away. According to this verse, in Christ we have access by faith to the blessings listed in Deuteronomy 28. And in Christ we have been redeemed and delivered from the curses listed in Deuteronomy 28. You see, Deuteronomy 28 serves to show us what God considers blessings and cursings what God considers a blessing or a curse. If you would tonight, do you all have an imagination? We all have imaginations. In fact, sometimes our imaginations get us in trouble. But I want you to use your imagination and imagine a chalkboard, big square thing, with a line drawn down the middle. Dividing that chalkboard into two columns. And at the top, on the left column, is the word blessings. And at the top of the right column is the word curses. Now, according to Deuteronomy 28, health would be listed on the left in the blessings column. And sickness would be listed on the right in the curses column. And yet today, many people in the church reverse this saying. They say, oh no, it's really a blessing that God gave me this sickness. I'm here to tell you that's not true. Because God has no sickness to give. I mean, can can you just think logically for a minute? Why would he make you sick? Then take it away. Oh, yeah, but pastor, I know people who have gotten sick. Welcome to the club. Listen, folks, I'm not insensitive to sickness and what sickness can do. I lost my mother at the age of three to lung cancer. 
Well, actually, that's what I was taught all my life. She didn't even, I saw her death certificate just a couple years ago, and to my amazement, did not say that she died from lung cancer. When she was at the age of 17, they found cancer in one of her lungs and removed it. Six months after my brother was born, she developed pneumonia in her remaining lung, and pneumonia killed her. And yet, she's always been listed and labeled as dying from cancer, but it wasn't cancer, it was pneumonia. You realize it don't take a whole lot to kill you? And let me remind you that the Bible says the thief cometh to rob, steal, and kill. That's Satan's trinity. Are you hearing me? So God doesn't make people sick, and yet in many churches today, it's taught that God will make you sick to teach you a lesson. And so I want to answer that if I can tonight because the question becomes, can some good come out of people being sick? Can some good come out of someone being sick? And I'm going to answer you. I'm not going to try to smoke you. Certainly. It's just like those who learn from the knocks, hard knocks of sin. How many know that we've all done some things that were terribly wrong? And some of us have been at times in our life where, where, where we were doing evil things and then all of a sudden life gets totally out of balance. And you wake up one day, just like the prodigal son, it says, and he came to himself. In other words, he woke up and he said, I'm a messed up person. I might even be demonized. I need to turn to God. And so they call on the name of the Lord in faith. They receive their salvation and they get delivered. That happens all the time. I've talked to people who have been put in prison for murder. Serving life sentences. And yet during their incarceration have turned to God. And become born again. Understand that what God does is he uses what is happening in your life to bring you to the end of themselves which causes them to become born again. And the moment they become born again, their lives are completely changed. They become saved and begin serving God. Now, I'm sure you can see how this could happen, but is it correct to say that the Lord calls them to go out and commit murder? No, it wasn't God who calls them to murder. I can guarantee you that the Lord tried to put restraints on them and obstacles in their way before they committed that murder. Let me tell you a little story that I just recently found, and, and uh, I, I was kind of shocked by it. God, everybody say God, God. our Heavenly Father, amen? amen? God tried to stop the two teenage boys from doing what they did at Calabine High School. During that shoot, they ki killed 12 of their fellow students one teacher, and then killed themselves, but not before they wounded 23 others. Now here's the story that really amazed me. One of those boys was in a youth Bible study the week before he did it. And the minister who was conducting the Bible study received a word of knowledge from the Lord. And he stopped the Bible study and said, somebody is here that is either thinking about killing themselves 
or killing someone else. Then he gave an invitation for a long period of time and pleaded for that person to respond. But he never did. The very next week, this boy and another boy went out and killed all of those students. You see, God was setting or putting a roadblock in that young man's life. He was dealing with him, trying to reach him, trying to get him to turn away from his course of action. And I'm telling you this because it wasn't God that led him to kill people, then kill himself. No, God in his mercy tried to stop him. And yet there are other individuals who have killed someone and even at some point afterward turn to God in repentance and faith. What I'm saying is the Lord can use even the things that the devil does in our lives. But it does not mean he caused it. I was going to call this sermon Change your stinking thinking. How many know that when you're in trouble, you cry out to God? The Bible's full of passages where people are in trouble one way or another, and they cry out to God. Why would you cry out to somebody who's making you sick? Why would you call, cry out to somebody who set you up for a fall? It just doesn't make sense. And yet in the church, we make it our theological belief. And then wonder why we don't get healed. Or why things don't come together in our life. Satan has caused people to be sick, infirmed, and diseased for eons. And yet, when these same people get sick, they cry out to God, turning wholeheartedly to Him. And many times, He does answer their prayers. And that's because He's gracious. That's because His Mercies are new every morning. Oh, now you're getting it. You know, sometimes what happens when we come to the end of ourselves and we crawl, call out to God and we wholeheartedly turn to Him, that's when we learn that we have been self-centered the whole time. We did what we wanted to do. And we did it the way we wanted to do it. How many know there have been times in all of our lives where we didn't care what God thought or what others thought? And the truth is that sometimes during sickness and disease you can learn some lessons about yourself. But please don't ever make the mistake of giving God the credit for making you sick. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? I believe in healing. God has used me to perform all kinds of miracles. And yet I've been sick. I've been healed. I was diagnosed with a brain cancer given six months to live. That was 20 some years ago. And I haven't had a headache since. Now, I'm not bragging about me. I'm just trying to say something. I grew, I grew up half my life blaming God for my mother's death. But it wasn't until I got a revelation of John 10.10. 10. You know, the Bible says if the thief be caught, he must restore. And when you get a revelation that God's not your enemy... 
that God's not the one causing the calamities and the sicknesses and the diseases in your life. It changes everything. I so appreciate the songs that we were singing tonight. That God is with us. God is for us. He's not against us. He's our healer. Over the last several weeks, the messages have been different, but in many ways the same. Because I want you to get a foundation of understanding that healing is part of Christ's atonement. Just as much as the forgiveness of sins. Sometimes we make such a mistake by, by just believing it, he died on the cross for my sin and that's it. But before he went to the cross, he was beaten for your diseases. By his stripes, we are healed. And in the same way, now stay with me, in the same way that we resist sin, are you ready? We should resist sickness. Next week, you don't want to mix next week. Next week, I'm going to be teaching the cop-out. We're going to talk about what I just said. Why it's so easy to blame God for everything. But in the same way that I would resist sin in my life, I should resist sickness. I shouldn't accept infirmity or disease just the same as I wouldn't say, Well, God... I know that you can help me not to sin. But I don't know if you want me to sin or not. I, don't, I mean, no, that's stupid. Maybe it's your will for me to sin. And the truth is, nobody would advocate that type of attitude. And yet Christians do that exact same thing when it comes to healing. God, we know that you can heal but we don't know that he will God if you don't want me to go out and commit adultery help me and if you don't commit adultery oh he helped me but if you did are you going to say God made me commit adultery well, who? but we do that with healing and as long as you tolerate sickness I almost want to tell everybody just sit tight and preach for two hours and just go into next week's because there's something in all of us that when we get sick we fight it oh come on think about it for a minute you run to the doctor you go get your prescriptions you, you do whatever you can do to get back to feeling good being healthy are you hearing me and we must develop the same attitude towards sickness that we do sin. I will not put up with sickness. I will not put up with the spirit of infirmity and disease. I resist this disease in Jesus' name. And if you start doing that, you will see God manifest in your life. God's word is his will how many agree with that God's word is his will now you can reverse that and say then God's will is his word or his word is his will am I right in 3rd John chapter 2 and I'm going to quote this from the King James because it's where I memorized it beloved beloved we're at family church tonight. We're family, right? Beloved, family, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Family, I want you to know that God 
want you healthy. And anything less is an attack of the enemy. Amen. Did I knock the chip off your shoulder? Don't ever say God made it happen. The truth of the matter is, many times we've been doing things in our own lifestyle that has caused the manifestation of sickness and disease. It's amazing how many people want God to heal their knees when they're 300 pounds overweight. Take care of the weight problem. And nine times out of ten, you'll take away the knee problem. We go to the doctor and he says, you're not eating right. And we go, oh, I'm just going to believe Jesus. Hello. Maybe you better start working on you. Because when you begin to move, see, faith isn't just simply believing. Faith is acting on what you believe. Sometimes you need to make adjustments in your life. I remember when I was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. I'm going to close with this real quick. When I was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, the doctor said, what are you going to do about it? I said, I'm not taking pills. I'm not taking insulin. He said, well, you don't need insulin, but you need pills. I said, no, I'm not going to take them. I'm just not going to take them. He said, why not? I said, because by Jesus' stripes, I'm healed. And so I just kept saying, I'm going to believe God. I'm going to believe God. I'm going to believe God. Nothing happened. My blood sugar started skyrocketing. I ended up on pills. I said, Lord, what's going on? I, I was going to trust you. And he said, son, if you would get control of your eating habits, you could defeat this disease. And so I lost 50 pounds, and my blood sugar started coming right back down. I went from 200 pounds to 150. Y'all hearing me? I had to do something on my end. Are you hearing me? Because we are wonderfully and fearfully made. God has created our bodies to function and heal itself if we take charge. He told me, he said, your problem is you're out of control. How many know that self-control is one of the fruit of the spirits? I wasn't operating in it, and so I was destroying my body. And when you begin to destroy your own body, disease can come in. Am I making sense to you? Jesus bore all of your sicknesses. He carried all of your diseases. But sometimes we even, when we're praying to Him and believe in Him to do His part, the truth of the matter is we're always looking for God to do His part when He's already done His part. So it's not a matter of getting Him to do something. It's getting us in a position to receive. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about next week, the big cop-out. Amen? Did you learn anything tonight? Amen. All right, so tonight we just have a few more minutes left of the service. So if you would, let's just get into maybe groups of three or four. And if you would take a moment, just maybe ask somebody in your group if they need prayer for something, if something's going on in their life. And then maybe talk about the, the biggest takeaway that you had from tonight's service. Maybe you feel like, oh, I don't need to get into a small group tonight. I heard the message. I'm good to go. But you might have something to share with somebody around you tonight that they need to hear. Let's say that I might have something that somebody in this room needs to hear. So would you just take maybe five minutes and just share something with somebody around you, groups of three or four, find people around you, maybe you have to move your seat. All right, take just a few minutes, share, maybe ask them what they need prayer for, and then share your biggest takeaway. <laughs> 